It's really wonderful to be here. What an exciting, extraordinary crowd. Uh, I kind of made the mistake of trying to prepare for this talk, which always just confuses me more. Then I also listened to everybody else's talk, which added to my uh, confusion. So I guess I'll just kind of dive in and, and see where we go. Uh, my background a little bit, I, I wrote a few books. One is uh, Breaking Open the Head, uh, which was on psychedelic shamanism. And in that book I explored ayahuasca, psilocybin, uh, iboga in Africa, uh, DMT, uh, research. Uh, dipropyltryptamine, uh, which is a sort of synthetic chemical cousin of dimethyltryptamine uh, that doesn't appear anywhere in nature as far as we know. Um, and that book kind of charted my own personal kind of uh, belief system switch, you know, from scientific materialism and kind of uh, cynical nihilism to accepting of kind of the shamanic realms, these other dimensions of the psyche, and, uh, and so on. And uh, definitely, yeah, thinking about the DMT experience in, in particular has been, has been a major like, lead motif in, in my life and my work. Um, you know, this idea of entities, I think, is an interesting one. I, I guess I think about it like there's different you know, ways of approaching it in terms of different occult systems or thinkers that we can look at which can give us angles or access to it. I mean, ultimately, I guess, all of my experiences combined led me to kind of have the perspective of like Vedanta non-dualism. You know, that, that in a sense, like, you know, this is all an illusion. Even the, the you know, the, the sense of personal identity is, is, is an illusion, you know, a necessary illusion, a necessary construct that, you know, the, the sort of one consciousness that's, that's manifesting all of this needs, needs to create all these separate identities, all, the, all these fragments of itself so that it can learn about its own creative capacities and, and grow and evolve. And, and I think sometimes we have a problem in the psychedelic community in that we get stuck a little bit on the glamour of the psychedelic experience and the glamour of these types of uh, entity encounters. And, and I think ultimately, like when I was thinking about the talks before, I was thinking that at some point it would be so interesting. Uh, I, went, I went to Dharamsala once, which is the headquarters of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, and I saw the Tibetan monks would be in the square doing this kind of uh, very active kind of dialog dialectical arguing, where they would make fine points around Tibetan Buddhist doctrine, and they would go, you know, ha! And the other monk would make a fine point and go, ha! You know, so they were actually like really sharpening their, their discernment and also in a way like their communication practices. And I, and I feel when I listened to all the talks today, I felt like we're really hovering, you know, at a, at a point where we can actually begin to have like a, a comprehensive, a more comprehensive perspective, a more, more comprehensive way of thinking and, and, and um, understanding, you know, what's happening in all these other, in other realities. This kind of, that it involves this kind of integration of uh, science and mysticism. Uh, and points maybe towards an evolution of science. That was, that was my idea when I, when I thought about the talk a little bit. Um, you know, as I mentioned a little bit, I really love uh, Rudolf Steiner's uh, work and his idea of a, a spiritual science. Um, and, and a spiritual science being, you know, I mean, our, you know, our science developed to deal with material phenomena as uh, what Andrew talked about, you know, the stuff in the objective world, making this distinction between the objective and the subjective. You know, we, we seem to have gotten pretty far down that line, and now the, the, the radical inversion is to start with the subjective perspective and to recognize that any science is ultimately a science within consciousness, right? That's, in the, the, that's the overarching field in which anything that we can understand as science kind of emerges. Uh, so I think a spiritual science is a more creative um, opportunity, in a way, for, 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 for going forward. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, it's also interesting the way, like, um, Culture works. I mean, culture, I think, has um, you know, negative aspects and some really positive, uh, some positive aspects and some very negative aspects. I mean, the, the positive aspect is culture, in a sense, is the um, learning from other people's learning, right? So, like, you know, can, people can jump into the discourse now at a much higher level than 30 years ago or 40 years ago because of all the learning that's been done and all the communication and all the, all the work and so on. So, you know, like, if, if I go to, you know, Pittsburgh and visit a, a kid who's been studying, you know, all this stuff. Like he'll have the same bookshelf that I will now, and he's had to. He had, but I had to sift that stuff for 15 years, and you can do it in six months. You know, so through culture we can learn faster and faster from the learning of other people's learning. Uh, but on the other hand, culture itself is an obstruction often. You know, cult, culture is kind of like the. Um, it's like it's like culture. You know, relates to the word cult. Like culture kind of. Um, takes the spontaneity and, and the innovation and the insight and kind of freezes it, you know? So even
whole idea of machine elves is one that I struggle with. I mean, Terence McKenna is like a kind of uh, you know semi uh, you know deity in, in this community, and he can, you know constructed this concept of machine elves, uh, and I think that almost becomes like a stopping point because then then people are like his language is so seductive, and he himself is such a spellcaster and a wizard that we get caught you know in his language. Uh, and we don't you know, go back into just the original perception or the spontaneous emergence of whatever is trying to emerge at that moment, whatever the hell it is, okay? Um, so yeah, so th those are some of my thoughts, and um, yeah, and I'll go through some of my own uh, experiences, I guess. Um, well, the one that I'm most eager to talk about, I mean, the, 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 we're talking about DMT entities uh, this afternoon, and it's all been in the context of NNDMT. There's another form of uh, DMT called 5-MeO-DMT, uh, which comes from a toad. Uh, how many people here have tried 5-MeO-DMT? Yeah. Uh, so that's a very different uh, experience uh, than an NDMT. And it isn't an experience that's generally rich with the glamour of all these entities. Uh, it's, it's much more like a um, kind of like a white light experience of pure consciousness or of what, you know, it, it sort of validate, validates experientially and phenomenologically kind of what Buddhists talk about as the void or nirvana. Uh, and uh, you know, when you're in that state, it's totally ecstatic, it's totally effortless, you totally surrender into it. Uh, you know, if you were to try to represent it uh, graphically, you know, the closest you could probably come to representing it graphically would be something like uh, Islamic patterns uh, that continue in all direction forever, kind of a white crystalline uh, lattice. Um, but the problem, I mean, the problem and the solution of that experience is there's no you in it. Uh, there's, there's consciousness itself, but there's no subject-object distinction. Uh, you know, I've had experiences where I came back from it totally euphoric, and one time, like, I, it, it, it spurred me, like, the next day I, I started making art. I just didn't even think about it when I started buying art supplies, and since then I've done, like, watercolors and paintings, uh, and I felt this sense of uh, infinity as this very comforting uh, phenomenon. Like, you know, normally we feel, I think, rushed uh, in our lives, because we know how limited our time is in, in this incarnation and these bodies and so on. Uh, with the, that, that earlier 5-MeO-DMT experience, I had this intrinsic sense that ultimately there's going to be all the time that we ever need to do whatever it is that we wanted to do. You know, whether it's, um, you know, sometimes I have fantasies about going back to when my daughter was like six years old and taking a year to like write a children's book with her. You know, somehow I felt like that experience will be safe, like there'll be a time when I'll be able to do that, whatever that means. I, it's, a strange, it's a strange idea. It's like, um, yeah, so, so we're trapped in this limitless, uh, this limited model of time, uh, it seems like. And then, and then this 5-MeO DMT experience kind of opens to an infinite uh, uh, dimension of time. Uh, but then I think also infinity is terrifying, or it can be, uh, because, um, you know, we can't really, I think it's actually, you know, beyond our minds to really conceptualize or, 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 hold, or hold what that is. And uh, in a sense, it's annihilating to our sense of ego identity or our sense of like what we, we, we plan to construct, what we can imagine constructing. I mean, let's um, you know, imagine the singularity happens and um, you know, our thoughts become instantly manifested. So any imaginative thought, any creative thought, any desire, any, any sensorial thought, you know, through some prosthesis of virtual reality combined with artificial intelligence and biotechnology, you know, there are people who, nanotechnology, there are people who really think that this is the, the destiny. You know, what, well, let's say that could happen if we you know, were to extend that thinking and imagine that we could have every sensorial experience and even expand into other sensorial capacities that we don't even quite understand yet. Like, what would, what would be the limit of that? I think we'd want to go to sleep, finally. We'd want, we'd want, to, we'd want to dissolve back in, into, into, the, you know, into the emptiness, you know. Um, so anyway, so I just raised that as these are the, 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 the sort of um, psychedelic philosophical boundaries that I, that I struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I've had many uh, experiences of entities uh, in, uh, you know, ayahuasca experiences. Uh, I worked with a group called the Sequoia, a tribe in the Amazon in Ecuador. Uh, and uh, they're very beautiful uh, lineage of uh, ayahuasca use. Um, we don't really know how far back it goes. Um, they were uncontacted maybe until the late 60s. Uh, there were about, you know, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're numbers, there's a little group that I worked with, their numbers have cut down considerably since the turn of the, turn of the last century. Um, they talk about the heavenly people, and they believe that the purpose of their ceremonies is to kind of um, interact with these, with these entities they call the heavenly people. And they do that through kind of an advanced spiritual technology um, that is extremely beautiful to be part of. Uh, you, you sleep, you're on hammocks, you're in this kind of, um, you know, temple that they've built, 
and uh, the temple becomes kind of like a extra dimensional spaceship and then they use their music and their songs to, to move this, this, this um, container into these different uh, astral realms and they'll actually check in with each other um, you know, during the ceremony, like they'll stop uh, they'll be singing and we'll all be in this like you know visionary space then they'll stop and they'll be saying to each other in their language oh are, are you seeing the blue people right now <laughs> they're like yeah i'm seeing the blue people it's like okay great you know and then off we go you know so um so once again like what are what are what are the heavenly people what are these entities i mean in this case it feels like um it's very much um interactive you know in a way it's like um it's like how um human beings direct their focus their intention their their creativity their prayer uh, is what allows for uh, the astral to kind of uh, crystallize uh, or, or, or form in, in certain respects. And, and depending on that level of focus and intention and discipline, uh, it may be that there are even experiences or, or, or um, events that cross the boundary between the psychic and the physical, like uh, the guy before was talking about is the psychoid. Uh, so for instance, the sequoia claim that um, when they're all together in these deep trance states, working together, uh, you know, if, if somebody in their tribe, if there are people in their tribe who are suffering from an illness, uh, they can actually all focus and they can manifest like a new plant. Like at the end of the night, the shaman will look down at his hand and they'll have like a seed or a cutting of a new plant in his hand that the heavenly people have just uh, provided to them, uh, which they then plant and it's like the tool, it's the, you know, it's the medicinal herb that they need to heal that condition. Uh, now that may sound totally far-fetched. Uh, I actually, you know, pretty much believe that that's the case. They probably can do things like that. I mean, I've also seen so many psychic effects and, and telekinetic and, and telepathic and all sorts of stuff. And I think that, um, yeah, when we uh, when we think about the trajectory, you know, in which this investigation maybe maybe extends, um, you know, it has to do with kind of. Um, recognizing that um, you know we have these latent capacities of the psyche that all these traditions tell us about that we know when we look at you know masters of chi or you know kundalini and so on and that and that maybe our future trajectory is to make uh, you know um, intentional use of them to, to, to reawaken these capacities and, and actually from from my perspective it might even be that um, the fact that we've um, unleashed a uh, very, very dire ecological emergency on the face of the, of the planet uh, was actually subconsciously something that we're doing uh, intentionally uh, to bring about a transformation of the psyche and to force us to access these latent capacities of the psyche using the tools that we have, which include these visionary plant teachers. Does that make sense to people? Yes. Cool, okay, good. So yeah, so I could see, for instance, this type of event uh, evolving uh, relatively rapidly uh, into something that involves kind of like a dialectical mind training, you know, where we're really trying to sync our communication strategies and our, and our way of understanding and communicating to others outside of this uh, framing. Uh, but then also, you know, actual practical work uh, to hone those kind of psychic capacities using, using all the, the range of tools that are available. And from my perspective, like this is, that is like a, a major focus of the future evolution of humanity. It's what Jose Arguel has talked about as uh, a shift from technological society to a psychotechnical civilization. Uh, I think um, Tom Roberts really does a good job in his book, um, The Psych Psychedelic Future of the Mind, where he talks about, once again, kind of shifting from the singularity idea of Silicon Valley and the technological elite to a uh, neuro-singularity. Uh, you know, using all of the, the um, knowledge that we're ga gaining about the brain, about body-mind states, to, to create, a, once again, a science, a spiritual science within consciousness that will allow us to, to make use of these latent capacities of the psyche, uh, potentially for um, ecological uh, regeneration and, uh, and then for other purposes. Um, so yeah, so, so the Sequoia uh, experiences were incredibly valu valuable to me. I had a crazy experience with um, uh, D DPT, dipropyl tryptamine, um, which was essentially, uh, well, I really like, so once again, you know, there's different thinkers who, who work on kind of the occult uh, areas, right? Like Gurdjieff or Rudolf Steiner or Foley or Castaneda, and they create kind of systems. And these systems are, you know, they sort of correlate loosely with each other. They kind of map on top of each other um, fuzzily in a way. Uh, I really like um, this idea, like William Warren Thompson put out, that these occult cosmologies are almost like, like almost like symphonic structures or like forms of music. Um, that once again, it's like getting beyond this literal dualistic mind frame, you know. So um, yeah, so in that respect, 
When I think about my experience with DPT and the, and the entities that I encountered with it, I would put them in a, in a, in a framing that, that Rudolf Steiner created, where he talks about um, Luciferic and Aramonic uh, entities. Have people heard about that at all? Um, so essentially, like uh, Steiner was an esoteric Christian. He was born in the 1860s. Um, he recognized that uh, he had profound visionary gifts. I mean, if you, if you, the, the sense one gets is that all he had to do was close his eyes, and he would be in the, the you know, the deepest part of an ayahuasca or, or, or a DMT vision. And that was just his reality, day after day, night after night. And he realized as a child that nobody else that he around him had that capacity. Uh, and so he, he was smart, and he actually got very quiet about it. He found like one old gardener who possessed like a second sight and talked to him about his visionary um, kind of investigations. But otherwise, he waited until he was like I think 40 years old and had studied studied Goethe's um, science papers and then his PhD and doctorate in philosophy. And then he began to um, speak out and, and write out uh, incredible volumes about his his visionary studies and his visionary researches. And you know, once again, it's a question of, of creating maps. You know, recognize that the map is never the territory, which is a mistake that we constantly make. That's the trick that culture always plays on us. But I like Steiner's uh, conception that um, you know, instead of there being like a unitary devil as uh, Christianity uh, imposes, he looks at these different forces, these kind of spiritual or occult forces that are that are working on us all of the time. And he divides the ones that have a, a negative or could have a negative or detrimental or destructive impact on us. Uh, he, into, into the categories of uh, Aramonic and Luciferic. So Aramonic is kind of like, Aramon was the evil uh, Persian earth spirit who kind of drags uh, human beings down into materiality, minerality, sterility, technology. And Steiner actually saw that our age was gonna be the um, kind of apotheosis of Aramon, the, maybe even the incarnation of Aramon uh, in human form. And it could be that artificial intelligence and that whole trajectory uh, is, is the fulfillment of what Steiner was kind of discussing and, and prophesying. And then the other side of the, the Aramonic is the Luciferic. So if the Aramonic is pulling us down towards materiality, you know, kind of sterility in a sense, the Luciferic is pulling us kind of up and out in a way towards uh, you know, genius, uh, arrogance, um, Kind of artistic uh, brilliance, you know. So, like, um, you know, in the ancient world, you know, when you know everybody had a sense, or you know, artistic, creative people had a sense of their own personal, not a demon, but a daimon, like the, like a spirit or a genie, like a spirit of inspiration. And people would have little shrines to the, to their daimons. They would have a very active relationship with that with that luciferic spirit of inspiration, you know. So, so we lost that as we as we went into this kind of materialist framing. Um, so, yeah. So, from my perspective. When I had this DPT experience with my friend, it felt like we were kind of beset by these very haughty, glamorous, kind of Oscar Wildean, Aleister Crowleyan entities who were having this massive party and were just like, totally appalled that us ridiculous little human beings had shown up in their territory and were laughing at us and so on, mocking us and so on. And, and one of them seemed to stay with me after the experience. And for several weeks, I would have um, kind of on the ongoing visionary you know, eyes closed trips, you know, visiting other planets and seeing these other realities and so on. And um, also there was what seemed to be psychophysical phenomena accompanied with that, uh, like a mirror, like I would wake, I would have a dream about this spirit in a certain form and then I would wake up and a mirror had fallen off the floor, uh, had fallen onto the floor in the other room, had fallen off the wall. And there were a number of things like that that, that just seemed like indications that this, this entity from the astral realm was kind of playing with me or, or you know, whatever, and, and I had to do kind of exorcism work with my friend to integrate it and so on. Have anybody else here had that type of experience in any kind of way? Yeah, all right, cool, nice. Um, yeah, so we have a basis to talk about something that, you know, where else can you even talk about this stuff in this society? I have no idea. Um, God, it's so interesting to be coming to this conference from Covent Garden in London and just like, you know, people in their suits, you know, with their very furrowed brows doing their various, you know, very, very serious things, you know, that involve God knows what, you know, and, and then we're here, you know, thinking about the, 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 the exploring the edge of, what, of our capacity, uh, you know, to, to, to have these experiences and, and understand them in a way. So, um, yeah, so, so anyway, so that for me, that, that DPT experience was very profound. And, and once again, it's not to get um, caught up, which is very difficult, in the glamour of these experiences. Uh, and I think, like, that's the next step, and that's why we really have to... I think go deeper into this whole idea of non-duality and, and non-dualism and recognize that this is all an, an illusion that's unfolding from that one consciousness that projects itself into these myriad infinite worlds, dimensions, forms of time, 
Uh, and of course, it's incredibly remarkable that we're here where modern time found at zero point, you know, so it's fun for me to talk about kind of the, the zero, the absolute zero point of consciousness, which I would have to say is this 5-MeO DMT experience. Um, anyway, yeah, so, so that was one thought stream that I thought to share with you. Um, you know, another way of thinking about uh, some of this stuff, I think it's, it's useful to think about the work of Gurdjieff, have people gotten into him at all? Um, you know, so, you know, what are, what are spirits, what are, what are entities? What are, what are extra dimensional beings? Um, there's a super great video on YouTube that's uh, called The Ten Dimensions Explained. Uh, and it looks at how, you know, obviously we know that we're in the fourth dimension. You know, if you go into like the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth dimension, you know, in the same way that we can travel through space, a being in those higher dimensions will be able to, to move through time, right? Time would be for them as, as simple as, as space is to us. Um, which I think is, you know, is interesting. I mean, you know, in that respect, well, maybe everything is being rearranged on us all the time, you know, and, and uh, as um, Patrick Harper says, you know, memory could just be the form that uh, our imagination takes when it really wants to uh, convince us of its validity. You know. um, anyway, what's that? Uh, memory is the form that imagination takes when it, when it really wants to convince us of its validity. I mean, you know, yeah, all we, all we truly know is that we're in this phenomenological moment, you know, at this point. Like, our, you know, our consciousnesses are sharing this room, this space. Everything else is an infer inference, you know, rumor, you know, symbol, you know, and so on. Um, but yeah, so, so Gurdjieff developed some fun <coughs> tools, I think, to just think about uh, this. Uh, oh, yeah, the, the writer who I referenced, by the way, I think is amazing and one of the most underappreciated Underknown thinkers, but you should definitely have them for the next uh, thing. Patrick Harper, H R H R P U R. He wrote a book called *The Alchemist's Secret Fire* and uh, *The Secret Tradition of the Soul*. Um, it, it's really about this understanding this uh, daimonic uh, reality, um, which is kind of um, yeah. I mean, we're trapped in our modern constructs in, in dualism, uh, in materialism, in a kind of reductive way of thinking, and. Uh, you know, Harper looks at this idea of a daimonic uh, reality, which is the realm of the soul, the, the anima mundi, the soul of the world, which is all about the thing that slips between our conceptualizations, our literalizations, you know, and it, and it embodies itself, you know, in you know, machine elves, you know, potentially flying saucers, crop circles. So there's, there's, there's force that's constantly seeking to subvert our, uh, our, our concepts, our, our, our dualisms, and so on. Um, and in fact, uh, if you look at indigenous cultures, you know, they don't really have uh, a belief in, in this literal reality in the same way that, that, that we do, right? Like, um, you know, <coughs> mythologies, <coughs> indigenous cultures are things that, you know, and we're both never were and always are, you know? So they're, they're looking at, 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 at time and reality from a, from a different lens that's just not, a, not as literal. And so when we get into this whole question that we get fixated on and our minds just clench on it and close on it, you know, are, are DMT entities real? You know, it's, it's like I think that we can, you know, break, break that lock, but, it, but it, it takes kind of work on an individual level to just sit with it like a, like a puzzle or a paradox and recognize that, you know, you, you actually, you know, you can embrace both sides of the paradox, you know, the real and the unreal, and even go beyond them and recognize that, you know, it's not real, it's not unreal, it's not not un unreal, it's not not real, you know, and so on. Um, but anyway, so, um, you know, one of, great, thank you. Uh, one of Gurdjieff's Gerd ideas is um, that um, you know, humans exist, we have a certain purpose in the cosmic order. Like every, every level of being has a purpose in the cosmic order. Um, and uh, what we do, like every level of, of being in, in this cosmic order, is we're like transformation stations. You know, we take in grosser forms of energy and we convert them into more subtle forms of energy. Uh, so we're constantly taking in, we take in food, water, we're constantly breathing, we're taking in oxygen, and we're also taking in perceptions, sensorial data perceptions. And then within our little internal furnace, we convert all of that material into um, concepts and feelings, right? And so from Gurdjieff's perspective, those concepts, those thoughts and feelings are actually the food that we're producing that nourish uh, spiritual beings. Uh, they, they nourish like the, the spiritual hierarchies, the, the, these other trickster, you know, elemental forces also. So that's actually what, what, what we exist to do, is to transform those more gross energies into the subtler energy that's like food for, for these other beings. And I think like that's a really beautiful uh, way of thinking about it. And, um, you know, it, it quite, kind of opens also, I mean, a writer on Gurdjieff noted that maybe that explains why, so, so in a way like humanity has a role which is to apply a certain, to, to 
produce a certain amount of the subtle energy that sustains the, the hierarchies of spiritual beings. And, and you know, if we don't produce that, because we're not going through initiations, because we're not refining and developing our, our spiritual capacities, uh, then the, 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 we, the Earth just makes more and more of us. You know, so the current overpopulation is happening because we're not, we're not, you know, we're, we're not using our consciousness to initiate ourselves and, and to project a higher form of energy, uh, which would be practices like devotion, like prayer. I mean, I think um, if you do ayahuasca, and I, as I said, I was a skeptic, a, a scientific materialist, and a nihilist, but you know, I've changed all that over time. And I think that actually we, um, we find that like devotion and prayer is an extremely subtle kind of a spiritual instrument uh, that, that when we use it with medicine, with ayahuasca, uh, it allows us to communicate with those uh, higher hierarchies. Um, yeah.